very welcome along. This is the first Tea Time Talk of 2022. Can you believe it or not? And we are still on Zoom. Today, the subject is how the retail industry changed the face of Dublin city centre, 1750 to 2000 with Dr. Mary Muldowney. Tea Time Talks, if you're new here, uh, is a series of talks which is kind of inspired by the history and the people of 14 Henrietta Street in Dublin 1. 14 Henrietta Street, if you haven't been in the yes, uh, is a social history museum of Dublin life. And I suppose it tells the story of the city through this building. You know, it's Georgian beginnings through to its tenement times. And it's run by Dublin City Council Culture Company. Uh, we run cultural initiatives and buildings across the city with and for the people of Dublin. Uh, my name is Dodo Fallon. And in a moment, I'm going to hand you over to today's speaker, just before we start, I want to make the point that you can get involved in this. There will be time uh, for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen there. And we'll do our best at the end to put as many of them to Mary uh, as we can. And if you're not new here, if you've been to a few uh, of these talks before, between Mondays at the Mess and Tea Time Talks, you may well know our speaker, Dr. Mary Muldowney. She is prolific. Uh, and very busy, one of Dublin City Council's historians in residence for the Dublin Central area, uh, the author of numerous books, book chapters, journal articles, uh, and involved in one of the finest history journals in the country, which is Sayher, the Journal of the Irish Labour History Society. She's also a member of the organising committee of that very, very important body. And I suppose her particular areas of interest are both deeply tied to the subject today, labour history, the history of work, the working class in Dublin, uh, and women's history. She's a member of the expert working group of the Grange Gorman Histories Project and involved in the oral history element of that programme and is well established as, a, as an oral historian in Dublin. So I'm really looking forward to this talk and the catalyst for asking Mary to do this was that this year will hopefully mark uh, the return of Cleary's to O'Connell Street in some way. And if you've been in our museum and you've been in Miss Dowling's flat, the last room of your of your tour experience you're just surrounded by stuff and we often wondered you know where did all this stuff come from you know what, what was the history of shops in the area and you know inner city dublin more broadly so that's what we're going to learn hopefully from mary today and without further ado i'll hand you over thank you so much donald and i'm actually just realizing i gave the first talk uh a tea time talk last year as well of the year and that was on Zoom too. <laughs> you know, hopefully 2023, you'll ask me again, but we'll actually see each other face to face. Anyway, um, my paper this evening evolved from a series of online talks I gave the Central Library in the spring of last year and was discussing the history of retail in Dublin from the mid 18th century to the final decades of the 20th century. I looked at some of the individual streets and what the shops that traded on them had to say about the changing face of the city. The talks were hosted by the Central Library, which is uh, currently in, as you know, uh, a shopping centre in the middle of uh, Dublin One, the North Inner City. So the topics for all of the talks were devoted to the local history of that area. Uh, and if people are disappointed that we're not going near the south side, uh, sorry, there just isn't time this evening. But Going to the main reason that we're here, uh, by the middle of the 18th century, we're looking at John Speed's map of Dublin here. Um, and at that stage, Dublin was experiencing significant prosperity as the seat of the Parliament of Ireland. The city had been expanding since Speed drew up his map in the early 17th century. Um, and it illustrates an essentially medieval style city. It hadn't, it had expanded, but it hadn't changed all that much in its nature. But by the 18th century, ambitious plans were being formulated by the city authorities and business people to reshape the old city and create a network of main thoroughfares. And this would be done by the wholesale demolition or widening of old streets or the creation of entirely new ones. 
elegant new houses would be built and provision was made for shops uh, where the residents and their servants could buy whatever they needed without having to travel too far from their homes. So they clearly weren't thinking about the working class of the time. Now, Luke Gardner, who many of you will know about, lived from 1690 to 1755, and he was a highly successful banker, developer, and member of parliament in the early 18th century. A dodgy sort of connection between the first two and the last, but he certainly used it to his own benefit. During his career, he acquired a wide variety of properties throughout Dublin. The major part, much of which he bought from the Moore family in 1714, was a large piece of land to the east of the then established city. Gardner had excellent connections through his various occupations, and they helped him in getting the land zoned for development. He was responsible for the elegant wide boulevard called Sackville Street, which is now, of course, O'Connell Street. Sackville was the name of Gardner's friend, the Duke of Dorset. The Wide Streets Commission, full, full title, Commissioners for Making Wide and Convenient Ways, Streets and Passages in the City of Dublin, was established in 1757 by Act of Parliament. It was one of the earliest town planning authorities in Europe. And the Commission had the authority to acquire property by compulsory purchase. They could demolish it, lay down new street and set lots along these new streets by way of building leases that were granted to developers. The Commission also had power to determine and regulate the facades of buildings erected along the line of the new streets and to decide on the number of houses in a terrace, the materials to be employed and the type and spacing of windows. So it's not by accident that a lot of those uh, 18th century buildings are elegant and uh, where unfortunately some of them have been interfered with and destroyed in the meantime. But the, the provision of this power to the Wide Streets Commissioners meant that even where a house was constructed by a different builder, the resulting terrace was regular in appearance. So from 1800 onwards, the Wide Streets Commission was playing a supervisory role in the development of Dublin, rather than initiating major restructuring of the city as it had done in the second half of the 18th century. With the successful establishment of Dublin City Council under the Municipal Corporations Reform Ireland Act 1840, the centralisation of the city's administration was abolished under the Dublin, uh, was, and uh, centralisation became politically feasible. The Wide Streets Commission was abolished under the Dublin Improvement Act of 1849 and the Commission's powers and property were transferred to Dublin City Council with the fact from 1851. Um, so this is kind of where we are legally in terms of the major developments that started in the 18th century and carried through to the 19th and of course the 20th. In 1795, Carlisle Bridge, now of course O'Connell Bridge, was completed. And this linked the North City to the South City and the administrative buildings at the top of Dame Street were linked in turn to the rapidly developing port of Dublin. Before Carlisle Bridge was built, it was almost like two halves of the city and all of the government buildings and the senior administrative offices were on the south side and uh, you had the growing um, commercial end on the north side, but also still many residences. This is a, really a late 19th century photograph, so it's unfortunately not giving you quite the experience the framework as it would have been if you were looking at it from um, 1900, for, from earlier, sorry. So uh, the bridge was designed by James Gandon, very well known for his work on the Custom House, Four Courts, the King's Inns and many others. 
The bridge was initially opened only to pedestrians in 1792, but when it opened to all traffic three years later, the commercial success of Sackville Street became established, especially in the lower end of the street. Going back to the 17th century, when Henry Moore was made first Earl of Drogheda in 1661, it was a reward for his family's loyalty to the Royalist cause during the English Civil War and the period of Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth. Moore began developing the land around St Mary's Abbey, creating Drogheda Street in 1728, which was a forerunner of O'Connell Street. Um, had several different names between, but he also called other name, streets after himself, making sure he was remembered. So you had Earl Street, Henry Street and Moore Street, among others, all connected with his own list of titles. The Moore family's motto, seen here on the coat of arms, roughly translated means better to fall at the gates than surrender them, which makes them sound like a fairly stubborn lot who believed in holding fast onto whatever property they had acquired. And they were very good indeed at that. They had adopted part of the lands of St. Mary's Abbey as their city residence, but Moore did not begin development work on their wider holdings on the north side of the Liffey until the first decades of the 18th century. The early history of Moore Street, and apologies for skipping through this so quickly, but um, I'm trying to reduce a lot of information to a reasonable time so we can have time for discussion at the end. Anyway, the, um, this article I came across a few years ago, and like so many in Dublin historical records, it's just fantastic. It was written in March 1972 by then historian Seamus Scully. He had grown up in Moore Street and he was obviously entranced by the stories that he unearthed when he was doing his research. He quoted from a letter written by a concerned citizen to the committee for conducting the free press with a complaint which might resonate today for people walking around Dublin's frequently scruffy city centre. Gentlemen, he wrote, an ingenious writer has mentioned and daily experience, experience verifies that the laws were made for the little. One instance I beg leave to give you. Curiosity led me every day for a week, lately to the lying in hospital through Moore Street, wherein near Britain Street lies a dunghill or heap of rubbish of about 20 yards in length, terminated by a butcher's stall, whereby that part of the street is rendered almost impossible in wet weather. And the small part of the pavement which is uncovered by the rubbish seems to have been a long time neglected. I had curiosity to inquire in the neighbourhood why this nuisance was suffered, etc., and was informed that it has remained nearby in the same condition for upwards of three years, notwithstanding many applications of the inhabitants of Moore Street to persons whose province it was to redress them. But the reason given me why such applications were fruitless and in vain was this that the ground on which the rubbish lies and the neglected pavement belong to a gentleman of fortune. So nothing much has changed in the meantime. By the middle of the 18th century, Moore Street was lined with small Georgian houses. And in the course of the 19th century, they began to evolve into a network of shops and businesses, including street stalls. And the street had gained a reputation at this point for its poultry shops, poultry shops and butchers, while the stall holders mainly sold fruit and vegetables. Scully, some of Scully's observations of the conditions in which people lived and worked in Moore Street in the middle decades of the century make fairly tough reading. And just move my ugly mug out of there. Um, during the horrifying famine of 1847, when starvation stalked the land and thousands were dying by the roadside or fleeing from the plague in the coffin ships, which cast a shadow over the national mind, which flickers even to this generation in this year in Moore Street, uh, referring to 1847, we find 62 shops of which only nine were butchers. 
but 41 of the others were dealing in food. At number 39 resided George Bonner, who was vittler to the Lord Lieutenant. In number 24 was John Bean, fishmonger to the same gentleman. William Hemming was at 41, a cheese and pickle and Italian merchant to His Excellency. Moore Market, now almost in shambles, had 13 shops, all dealing in food, two of which supplied His Excellency with fish. The present insignificant Riddles Row, long gone sadly, had 27 houses which contained 32 butchers shops or stalls, and Mr John Ryan at number one had the honour of supplying meat to His Excellency. George William Frederick Villiers, whom you see here, the fourth Earl of Clarendon, was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland from May 1847 to March 1852. So clearly his appetite wasn't at all troubled by the misery in which other members of other residents of the country were living. So moving on again swiftly, uh, the general post office, the, sorry, the importance of Sackville Street as commercial location had been underlined by the opening of the general post office in 1814. Historian Peter Pearson noted that such was the importance of the GPO that it had possibly, quote, the combined prestige and power of Unpost, RTE, and all the telephone companies put together. He wrote that before uh, the extent to which the internet has spread, but one gets the message or the idea. Francis Johnson was the architect and his classical design reflected the standing of the GPO as the hub of commercial and private communications. But really what was key to the development of Sackville Street um, was the development of department stores, um, particularly uh, reflect, as a reflection of the increasing modernization of the city. McSweeney Delaney and Company was the predecessor of Cleary's, and it opened a monster mart on Sackville Street in 1853. And this early department store has been frequently referred to as the oldest in Europe. However, uh, that title belongs more accurately to Le Bon Marché in Paris, which opened in 1852, the previous year. It was the brainchild of Aristide and Marguerite Boussicot, a husband and wife team who pioneered retail concepts that we now take for granted. The history of the department store is inseparable, inseparable from the history of modern cities, including Dublin. Some of the practices that the Busico developed were definitely adopted by the owners of other Dublin stores that opened in mid 19th century, especially Arnott's. The Busico's original ideas can be seen in many of the practices of the Henry Street store, although they were not exclusive to Arnott's. The Busico's, for instance, came up with the concept of the one stop shop, which was reproduced in many cities. This meant you could buy everything from trousers to bed sheets and tableware to furniture and toiletries all under one roof. And this soon left behind the many specialist shops that proliferated in the commercial streets and meant that shopping was both time consuming and frustrating. The shopper had to go from one place to another if they wanted different items, and they also tended to be at the mercy of the assistants, who are usually male, whose job was to present the customer with the items that the retailer wanted to sell, not necessarily what the buyer needed. In the department store, customers were invited to enter and browse at their leisure and no purchase was necessary. Now, you can see here that uh, there's uh, Arnott's, which here's the central area. This was before the major fire that occurred at the end of the 19th century, but was later restored. Um, but they were 
emulating Le Bon Marche, which you can see the extraordinary interior here, uh, as indeed did Cleary's, and this is the interior of Cleary's a little bit later. But the Arnott's were particularly keen on some of the uh, ideas of the Boost Code, such as offering a refund if a person suffered buyer's remorse. They could exchange or return the item for a full refund. And this was really the emergence of shopping as a leisure activity, as it removed the pressure that followed the concentrated attention of assistants in the old style stores. The presence of the department store changed another aspect of the city centre, whether it was in Paris and Dublin or in other cities, where their foundation changed the nature of the streets. Especially if you were a woman with plenty of disposable income, going shopping in the first half of the 19th century and previously could be a dangerous occupation and you probably didn't get to do very much of it. Not least because having multiple packages from a variety of stores made you vulnerable to thieves. Well-heeled women were usually accompanied by servants or a male escort. The department store changed that because now women were free to browse and have their purchases delivered. The development of public transport, such as buses, trams and trains, also owed much to the existence of department stores. And the important thing about a lot of the public transport going into the city centre is where the termini were situated, as for instance, um, in O'Connell Street or Sackville Street still, um, or uh, other areas that were close to the new department stores. In May of 1852, Peter Paul McSweeney and George Delaney formed a business partnership, which would be the basis of their ambition to open a new store that would grace Sackville Street with its architectural magnificence. They bought the leases to 23 to 28 Lower Sackville Street, replacing the series of small shops which had been on the site since the street was first developed in the previous century. You can see further up the street there what you're, you know, we're talking about with small businesses, and then there's the monster mark going in. Um, they held a competition for the design and building of their new premises which was won by William Colbeck, uh, although the, his entitlement to credit for the building was disputed by William D. Butler, another very well-known architect at the time. He claimed that the winning design had been stolen from him. He took his complaint to the Council of the Institute of Architects, where it was not sustained. However, it seems that Delaney had bought Butler's design for the facade and the part of the building immediately behind it, while Colbeck was responsible for everything else, which was by far the largest part of the work. This painting of the new Mart was the work of Michelangelo Hayes, whom you see here, who was married to Peter Paul McSweeney's sister. He was very well known at the time as a painter of horses and military subjects. Presumably on this occasion, he was doing a favor for his brother-in-law. George Delaney came from a family who had long had their own drapery business at 13 Sackville Street, and he seems to have brought the retail experience to the partnership. Excuse me, Peter Paul McSweeney, who served as Lord Mayor of Dublin twice in 1864 and 75, brought the financial backing. McSweeney was well known in the city, not least for his involvement in the campaign to have a statue to Daniel O'Connell, to whom he was related, erected in Sackville Street. Excuse me. And he laid the foundation stone in 1875 during the second term as Lord Mayor. He had previously laid the foundation stone for the O'Connell Memorial Round Tower in the Last Nevin Cemetery. Unfortunately, there don't seem to be any contemporary pictures of the interior of the palatial mart as it came to be known from this early period. We do know that the new premises were five stories high which was compared to the four stories of the neighbouring buildings, and it shared the upper floor of number 27 with the Imperial Hotel, which was next door at number 28. 
The hotel had been built in 1837, and you can see it here. So in a sense, uh, the Cleary's Quarter that is due to open fairly soon uh, with its combination of uh, commercial and hotel uh, business on the premises is going back to the origins of the building in the 19th century. The new venture was extremely popular. Customers who welcomed the idea of one big store with many departments. Obviously, it was equally unpopular with the small retailers whose businesses were threatened by the arrival of the new mart. The store's target market was mainly the prosperous Catholic middle classes, where, and they were the very people who had previously patronised the specialist shops. For the first half of the 19th century, Dublin city centre was dominated by these small family-run businesses. But with the arrival of the department stores, the small shop owners accused the monster houses of putting them out of business by undercutting prices and monopolizing the attentions of the shoppers. There was a fair amount of truth to that accusation because the department stores were more attractive to consumers. They were in a position to bulk buy their wares and could indeed keep prices down. They also displayed their prices, which meant that a shopper could decide whether or not they could afford to buy an item and avoid the potential humiliation of having to haggle. From the 1860s on, when shop girls, as they were known, were increasingly present, this development made it even more appealing for women to shop in the department stores, where they could be served by other women when buying clothing, especially such sensitive items as lingerie. Bus services, tramways and railways grew in parallel with the growth of the middle classes in the city. In a fascinating account of uh, commercial Dublin in the 19th century, I really can't recommend this book highly enough, uh, Dr. Stephanie Raines describes the city's buoyant commodity culture in the context of the technological and social evolution that characterised Irish Victorian experience. One of the major features of the growth of Dublin city in the second half of the 19th century was the increasing numbers of middle class people and the homes that were built to accommodate them. In tandem with these homes in areas like Rathmines and Rathgar to the south of the city, <coughs> excuse me, and Glasnevin and Drumcondra to the north, there was mounting consumerism as homeowners with disposable income sought out furnishings and decorative items for the houses and ready-made clothes for themselves. The development of mass transit in the shape of buses and trams connecting the new suburbs to the city centre facilitated expansion in shopping outlets and the consequent appeal of department stores, which could supply all the consumer goods that were wanted under one roof. In the 1860s, McSweeney and Delaney's palatial mart was thriving. In 1878, the new mart was renovated and enlarged in anticipation of the exhibition of arts, industries and manufactures that was to take place in Dublin in 1882. The front facade was extended from eight bays to 11, uh, can't quite see the last of them, uh, absorbing the old structure of the Imperial Hotel into a continuation of the shop facade, although the hotel remained a separate business. There were six display windows opening onto Sackville Street, including large plate glass windows, which was then a very new and expensive invention. Inside, there was the great centre hall, which we saw earlier, which was lit by natural light from above, while around it were uh, galleries supported by Corinthian columns and reached by sweeping staircases with elaborate balustrades, which I have to say, as a child, I remember charging up and down and thinking it was just so fantastic. Um, and I believe that it's being restored as part of the new uh, 
uh, building that's opening there soon. So shop, shop assistants lived on site in dormitories along until the early 20th century when um, Mihol Olohan's uh, Union of Administrative and Distributive Workers managed to stop the practice. And their sleeping quarters, along with the refectory and library for the staff's use, were located on the upper floors of the building. Actually, not many shop assistants living on the premises had that level of luxury. The renovations cost £50,000, which was a huge sum at that time. However, the following year saw an economic recession and McSweeney's attempts to recapitalize with the introduction of new partners uh, could not save the store. By 1882, the new mart was bankrupt and McSweeney's health was in rapid decline. The receiver of the company sold the store to this man, Limerick man, Michael Cleary, Michael John Cleary, for £32,000 and it reopened as Cleary and Company in 1883. Cleary was bankrolled by William Martin Murphy, well known for other reasons, who was a family friend and his own father-in-law, James Fitzgerald Lombard. A formal partnership agreement was signed with the two wealthy businessmen. During the early years of the 20th century, effective control of Cleary's therefore passed into the hands of the Murphy family. This is a rather pixelated picture, I'm afraid, when I blew it up, but I didn't have time to go find a better one. Um, anyway, Easter week 1916 witnessed the almost complete destruction of Cleary's in the course of the rising. It was still under Murphy's control when it was completely destroyed by fire during the rising. A uh, barricade on Lower Abbey Street was hit by a British shell from the gunboat Helga, which also bombarded Liberty Hall in the mistaken belief that the rising was being directed from there. The resulting fire spread to Cleary's and the Imperial Hotel, completely destroying the entire building except for the front facade. Oscar Trainer, who was an eyewitness, later claimed to have seen Cleary's plate glass windows melting in the heat of the flames. However, despite this, only a few weeks later, in June 1916, the store opened temporary premises in the Metropolitan Hall on Lower Abbey Street <coughs> excuse me, and began trading again. Their new building opened in August 1922 and cost £400,000 half of which was paid for by the British government's Property Losses Ireland Committee. Businesses like Cleary's tended to be better compensated than individuals who claimed from the fund. Several of the claims were from individuals who had apparently been storing goods in Cleary's warehouses at the back of the building. The company was not financially secure when it reopened in the early 1920s, not least because William Martin Murphy had died in June 1919 and his financial know-how and support was sadly missed. The company might have gone under sooner had it not been for Dr Lombard Murphy, one of William Mer Martin Murphy's sons, who recommended the appointment of this man, John Maguire, who had already been successful in saving the fortunes of other retail businesses. Maguire was appointed manager of the store in 1923, and he brought with him plenty of innovative marketing ideas. By the early 1930s, however, Maguire became a victim of his own success when he was driven out by the Murphys. He went on to buy Brown Thomas's store in Grafton Street and repeated his success story there while Cleary's started to fail. In 1940, Cleary's was made bankrupt for a second time and a receiver was appointed who closed the shop, fired all of the staff and sought to sell off the firm's assets. It was eventually purchased by Dennis Guiney, owner of the extremely successful store just around the corner on Talbot Street. Dennis Guiney paid £230,000 for the store and all its stock. And this allowed Cleary's to reopen and resume trading under the name of the company that Guiney set up for the purpose, which was Cleary and Company 1941 Limited. 
He invested in the shop's restaurant and also established a ballroom, uh, which could accommodate 500 patrons and had a full orchestra. It became known as one of Dublin's most glamorous social spaces during the 1950s and 60s. By this point, Cleary's was central to the business life of O'Connell Street and indeed to Dublin's relationship with rural areas in particular. Traditions developed around both the entertainment facilities as well as the shopping. Courting couples arranged to meet under the clock and then they could head into the building to eat in the restaurant or the cafe, uh, depending on their budget. The clock you see here was installed in 1990 to mark the 50th anniversary of Dennis Guiney's purchase of Cleary's. There was a side entrance to give access to the ballroom when the store was closed. When it was open, it was aimed mainly at middle-class shoppers with disposable income. Until the early 1960s, Dennis Guiney insisted that the staff should dress formally. It seems that he was Guiney that was operating Cleary's as a rival to Arnott Switzers and some of the higher-end stores such as Brown Thomas. He aimed the Guiney shops in Torbell Street at people who needed to be more budget conscious, but goods were never shoddy and customers celebrated the value for money that was provided. His massive investment paid off during the 1940s, with Cleary's being back in profit by the end of the emergency, when other businesses had been struggling to survive. Uh, the store continued to prosper, not least because of its location. Trams were still able to drop suburban shoppers at Nelson's Pillar, almost directly opposite Cleary's front door, and the expansion of travel via bus and the increasing numbers of private cars contributed to growing revenues. Rural shoppers could get a train to Amiens Street Station, Connolly, and walk up to Cleary's, have a meal, and then start their serious shopping. Many Dubliners will remember the huge numbers of people who came from outside the city for such a journey on high days and holy days before the advent of local shopping such uh, centres made such journeys less appealing. The trams were replaced by buses from 1949, but this had no effect on Cleary's. The country was struggling through a financial depression, but the centenary of the foundation of McSweeney and Delaney saw its successor doing very well indeed. The firm prospered, and in 1965, Guiney refused a London-based offer of £11 million for Cleary's, but business began to slow down after his death in October 67. He was buried beside his first wife, Nora, in the last century. Mary Guiney challenged his will so that she gained complete control of the business. And I suspect there's a soap opera of a story there, but we didn't have time to explore it right now. Anyway, she had worked with Dennis in the Talbot Street store before he bought Cleary's. Uh, the Guiney family then continued to own or control the firm until Mary died in 2004 at the age of 103. But by 2012, the shop was in receivership again. Now, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I do hope we can talk about it afterwards. But since I had said the paper was up to 2000, I decided to be good and stick to my own parameters. So going back to the 19th century, in 1843, George Cannock and Andrew White had sold their wool and linen drapery business, wholesalers business in Cork and moved to Dublin, to 14 Henry Street. The city had a population of 250,000 at the time, so it must have seemed like a better potential market. Um, Despite the horrific conditions in some parts of the country, remember that this was the year of the Great Hunger. The first two years trading were so good that Cannock and White needed to expand, and they borrowed £6,000 from bankers Andrew Reid and his son Patrick to add 13 Henry Street to their premises. 
According to the Dublin Almanac and Directory, which is the predecessor to Tom's directory, the business in numbers 12 to 14 Henry Street was devoted to general drapery and haberdashery with the addition of house furnishings after 1855 and a consequent movement towards department store status. In 1848, Andrew White died and Sir John Arnott, seen here, uh, came into the story at this point and he invested a further £6,000 to buy his 16 Henry Street. Over the next few years, other buildings were added to the main premises, some for storage. In the 1880s, a new unified frontage was added to the buildings facing out to Henry Street, prominently displaying the Arnott's name. By the final decades of the 19th century, Henry Street was a bustling mixture of shops, cafes and restaurants, jewellers, dressmakers and tailors and residences. The city had a population of roughly 280,000 at the time, uh, or sorry, that was the beginning of the century, and over the next 200 years until the end of the 20th century, Dublin grew enormously, creating a welcome market for the many retail businesses in Henry Street. As the suburbs around Dublin increased in size during the 19th century, so did the transport infrastructure, so it was easy enough to come shopping in the city centre, provided you of course had the money. A wide range of elaborate new purpose-built department stores were built in the city in the second half of the 19th century, and these are all um, Northside stores. Um, the included Todd Burns, um, which is where Penny's is now, and uh, this is the back view of Arnott's. You can see how large the building was going, of course, that's facing... Um, Looks like it's facing, the, yeah, the redundant. Uh, but they were middle class institutions to a great extent, and they mainly evolved from drapery stores. Uh, e. Marks and Company had uh, the original Penny Bazaar, and uh, you know, McDowell's, McDonald's um, dentist. But there was also McDowell's, the ring house, which I think was around about that time it was founded. And of course, Woolies. I don't have time to talk about Woolies today because, uh, which is rather a shame, but it's, I don't want to skip over it with one sentence, which actually is what I'm doing, isn't it? Uh, anyway, there were, uh, there had been eating houses and small service businesses in Henry Street during the 18th century, but the numbers expanded during the 19th particularly after the arrival of the department stores. And then this, this also related to shopping as a leisure pursuit. And trips to Henry Street or Grafton Street on the south side often involves stopping for a meal or refreshment before bringing purchases home. And of course, the stores then started developing their own in-house cafes and restaurants because you weren't going to let business go elsewhere. But during 1916, the rising, as it wasn't just Cleary's, it was badly damaged, and Henry Street really was uh, almost at the top of it anyway, nearly wiped out by the British Army. Some businesses were completely uh, eliminated, while others were in a position to claim for damages to property from the Property Losses Committee. And it was a wartime body which had been established for the First World War, so it wasn't just related to the aftermath of the rising. Weirdly, injury and loss of life was not covered, nor was loss of earnings. So if you lost property, you'd do much better in terms of getting compensation than um, if you had lost the means of making a living. For instance, Margaret Masterson had a dressmaking business at 33 Henry Street, and she claimed £18, 8 shillings and 10 pence halfpenny for clothing and personal belongings. She was paid £10, 5 and 4 pence. Alice McAvoy, trading as Or Scott of 7 Henry Street, claimed for £354, 3 shillings and 10 pence for destruction of glass, damage to property and for looting of clothing goods at 7 Henry Street. And she got nearly all of it back 
um, 300 pounds paid by the committee. And the only reason they didn't pay the rest of it was because they said her insurance covered the damage to the glass on her door. Uh, so that was disallowed. The committee's re caution about reimbursement seems to have related to the size of the claim. Claims lodged by business agents were responded to much more favourably than those lodged by individuals, especially when the amounts were small, with a great portion of the amount claimed being granted if it was a big enough claim. As early as May 1916, the Henry Street Warehouse, which was later to become Roach Stores and then Debenhams, um, was advertising costumes and coats injured by rifle fire. The dressmakers and milliners who had been a presence in Henry Street for the previous uh, century were being replaced by manufacturers operating from factory premises. And these maps were compiled by two of uh, Dublin City's great historians, Joseph Brady and Ruth McManus. Um, th they specialise in the history of housing development and uh, how the city has grown, particularly in the last two centuries. But uh, they show how, you know, here you would have had these shops, the milliners and dressmakers, in smaller houses, admittedly, but on Mary Street, Henry Street, and up through Earl Street and Talbot Street. But then they ended up going, being moved further back into um, the small laneways at the back, at the rear of the main street. It was less true of the boot and shoes trade, which you can see are still there on the main streets and, of course, emerging onto the south side as well. But these were being sold on the premises rather than being produced. So there wasn't the same impact as uh, the change had uh, on the uh, milliners and dressmakers. By the time the 1940s and 50s were reached, the shops included, the, the shoe shops included Boylan's, Fitzpatrick's and Tyler's, all of them household names. Throughout the years we're discussing here, some of the hardest working people on Henry Street were literally on the street. They were the street traders who were often carrying on generations long tradition in their families, earning money by selling from their carts and prams. In 1980, following pressure from the Dublin City Centre Business Association, the government updated the Illegal Street Trading Act, introducing fines of up to £200 for breaching the law. The Dublin City Centre Business Association represented the bigger businesses in the area, including Arnott's Road Stores and the ILAC Centre. Henry Street and Mary Street were non-designated areas for casual trading. In July 1985, when Gardaí arrested two female, female traders for breaches of the Illegal Street Trading Act, other traders marched up Henry Street to O'Connell Street in protest. Gardaí came in when the traders blocked the traffic, and when they refused to move, seven people were arrested, including uh, independent TD, Tony Gregory, Joe Costello of the Prisoners' Rights Association, later to be a TD and minister himself and now a councillor, and Councillor Christy Burke, looking extremely young there, um, and four women traders. The media showed a great deal more interest in the male politicians than there had been in the case being made by the traders, <coughs> excuse me, who were mainly women. The matter was eventually settled when the corporation agreed to license a certain number of the traders. Um, I'm conscious of running out of time here. Um, so from the 1930s, Henry Street had been one of those streets designated by the City Council for the prohibition of horse-drawn vehicles between the hours of 12 and 6.30 p.m. Um, but uh, in the uh, 1970s, you can see how choked the street was with traffic. So various uh, ideas were implemented to see if it could be improved. Uh, 
and cars could be parked on one side of the street was the first one, uh, but that didn't really improve matters. And a further instruction was introduced when the waiting time for private cars was reduced to 20 minutes. But uh, correspondence to the city council pointed out that nobody could possibly go shopping in 20 minutes. So that was uh, changed and eventually the street was pedestrianised in 1986. And you can see then Lord Mayor Jim Tunney marking the occasion with the assistance of some of the women who worked on the street in the various stores. And I'm presuming it was the photographer who encouraged the women to show off their legs rather than the male politicians who are surrounding them. You can see Bertie Ahern there um, without his anorak. In the early 1970s, the development of the ILAC shopping centre was facilitated by the demolition of some of the old area around Moore Street and uh, particularly the area of markets, um, all of which were wiped out uh, at that stage. It had been planned since the 1930s and an American expert was brought in the 1950s. But when the uh, corporation um, partnered with the Irish Life, uh, scaled the, 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 what happened was a considerable scaling down of the original plans. And um, after the corporation uh, finally got the money out of Irish Life, we reduced considerably to only 200,000 square feet compared to the 400,000 uh, square feet of retail originally planned, as well as offices and very, uh, a hotel and cinemas, a theatre, restaurant and bars. So it really was considerably diminished from the original plans. Now, most people will be familiar with this glorious building, which was originally built um, at Fort Todd Burns, but has now been taken over by Pennies. Uh, it is still just an amazing building and deserves standing back as far as you can on the far side of the street to study it, uh, especially for the uh, Copper Dome on the top. Todd Burns found fame for fashions and house furnishings. The company was listed in Tom's directory as basically dealing as silk mercers, shawl men, linen and woolen drapers, tailors, hatters, boot and shoemakers, upholsterers, carpet warehouse men, uh, cabinet makers, haberdashers, hosiers, lovers and jewellers. Um, I don't think Penny's quite reaches that range. But shopping habits had been changing in the Edwardian period around the turn of the century, and Ted, Todd Burns became known especially for its ready-made clothing and made-to-order business. Customers could shop via the store catalogue and get their purchases by post. So that extended the business all around Ireland an early precursor of online shopping. Before that, shopping was all about selecting fabrics and trimmings from drapers and haberdashers and either making your clothes yourself or having your look created for you by a dressmaker. The Todd Burns idea has since grown into the fashion business model of shopping ready to wear we know today. Now, they're not unique, of course. With this in mind, it's interesting to see the shop providing trend-driven fashion at an affordable price still continues in the same store with pennies. In recent days, there's been increasing uh, criticism of fast fashion on which the pennies business model depends. And it would be really interesting to explore how the retail industry is changing to cope with major environmental concerns and examine how the merchandise the retail industry produces for sale in Dublin is adapted in the future, just as the architecture and infrastructure was altered in the past. This is a CGI version of the transformation planned for Moore Street. And of course, in the not too distant future, the Central Library will be moving to Parnell Square, where it will have significantly improved facilities and space, but no retail outlets. So I thank you for listening to this incredibly rapid trip around the area that has been the centre of Dublin's retail industry for so many years. And I would like to say that the individual presentations 
uh, which I gave last year are available on Vimeo if you just do a search for my name and retail in Dublin and um, you get a little bit more sense than this uh, very truncated version. And if you have any questions now, I'd be delighted to take them. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks so much uh, for that, Mary. That was it's it's always difficult to to condense that incredible story, but but you managed to do it, and and you brought us from from Gardner to to Tony Gregory and, and back again. It was a really really fascinating journey. Uh, a couple of questions came in. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put them to you. Uh, an observation, first of all, from 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 Zoe, who, who made the point that the original architectural features, uh, the original plans for the Todd Burns store, were were put up by the Dublin Civic Trust today on Twitter. If people want to have a look at them, that's twitter.com forward slash Dub Civic Trust. They do great, great work for the, for the city. Yes, uh, yeah. And Mark Crowther asked, apart from Arnott, Skynes, Easton's, are there any other original retailers on, on the north side from, from that era? Oh, gosh, I have to think about this a bit. <laughs> and... Eason's really was sort of late 19th century. Uh, I'm sure there are, Mark, you, you sort of caught me off guard. <laughs> I'd have to go through my trusty thumbs and just see how many of them are there, you know, that were, were or were not replacing. An awful lot of the, you know, the other end, the upper Sackville Street, were devoted to things like, uh, printers and schools, you know, various kinds of, you know, secretarial colleges, that sort of thing. And uh, so they were very, uh, there were small, very small businesses, usually in one building. So what was originally built as a very elegant house for um, one family and the servants had become taken over. So, uh, so, but but a lot of those were there for a very long time. <laughs> I, I really couldn't say off the top of my head exactly which ones there are, but I, I'm absolutely sure that they were there. There's a question from Joan. I, I don't know the answer to this. It's a very good question. Uh, when were the streets concrete over? Um, the development of the streetscapes? I suppose that's when you that's when you want Joe Brady around, isn't it, for a question like that? Uh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, most of them were still uh, cobbled in the early years of the 20th century. You know, so I, I think it was a sort of a gradual thing. And um, as the traffic and the, uh, particularly up in the 1930s when uh, Henry Street was being closed off to horse-drawn traffic outside certain times, uh, they were still being allowed to bring carts down for the delivery of uh, alcoholic beverages and various other things. So, you know, there were pubs along there that were, and restaurants, of course, were having things delivered. Um, I can imagine that it must have been a nightmare walking through there with the detritus from the horses on top of the cobbles. But they, they were very slowly being removed. Uh, Eileen asks, uh, where can I get more information about William Catbeck's part, William Catbeck's part in designing what became Cleary's? Oh, um, well, there are various sources. Uh, usually, Archeseek is the first point of yeah. call for trying to find something, you know, and uh, they will have various references. Um, and of course, Joseph Brady and others who write for that amazing series uh, about the history of Dublin's infrastructure and development. Um, there's usually uh, the, the, the particular references. So I think that go to Archeseek first. There's also a register from the Institute of Architects that gives little biographical details of different architects. So that's where I would have got that little gem about the dispute over who actually designed the Cleary, well, the McSweeney and Delaney building. And I, I'm going to ask the last one myself. Uh, given, given your work as a, a, an oral historian, 
Um, are there any surviving kind of oral histories of retail workers in Dublin? Some of them were interviewed by Ke- Kevin Kearns in, the, in yeah. the various books, but it seems to me an area, for example, Dunn's workers and, 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 and the South African issue, it seems like that you, there's great potential for good oral history around this stuff. Uh, there absolutely is, and I would dearly love to have the time to do it, but um, I'm not aware of a specific one. I mean, Stephanie Rain's book about the 19th century is good, but she obviously couldn't do oral history interviews. <laughs> um, I would love, you know, Mary Manning's book on the Dunn's dispute is fantastic because it's written from the bird's eye view she was there through the whole thing uh, and I didn't even go up to Dunn's tonight because it's worthy of a whole talk by itself mm-hmm. um, but also you know what happened to the Cleary's workers after it was shut down was, or well from when it was shut down to the appalling profit that Doreen Foley or whatever Deirdre Foley made you know that was um, that's an amazing story and does need to be followed up. I know a lot of the papers covered, you know, did interviews with the various people, but then when the deal was being done with the SIP to a union to try and look after them afterwards, um, I think some kind of non-disclosure agreement. I mean, I'm speculating here, but suddenly everything went silent. So I'm hoping that we will see some of the original workers being employed when the new centre opens. So, folks, with that, uh, I want to thank Mary for, for giving that talk and, and to all of you for coming along tonight. Be sure to check out Mary's other talks on, on YouTube, uh, not just this series, but on, on other things like the, the, the bombing of North Strand and on, on the Mansion House and Lord Mayor's True History. Lots of really, really interesting stuff uh, on there w- w- worth watching. I hope that we see you at other events in the future. We do these tea time talks uh, around 14 Henrietta Street, but we also run other things you might be interested in. Mondays at the Mess, which run out of Richmond Barracks, uh, but also on Zoom at the moment, celebrates the kind of rich stories and experience of that local community. And the first of them is coming up next week uh, with Liz Gillis looking at Kathleen Clark, Dublin's first female Lord Mayor. Uh, Culture Club, which is a series of hosted talks and tours, that introduce and encourage people to connect with cultural spaces in the city. The National Neighbourhood, which runs all year and creates ways for people to see and make culture in their place with people they know. And if you want to know more about these things, uh, check out our website. Uh, So we are Dublin City Council Culture Company. Hope you enjoyed this talk and that we'll see you at more events in the future. Uh, But until next time, it's long a fall. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for the invitation to speak.